The gown was of green and gold, in texture a stiff brocade, in appearance, when held at arm's length, like to a glittering lizard, but when held more closely, seemed to be covered with a design of tiny peacock's eyes. Its narrow skirt hung straight from waist to ankle, a waist which lay close under Mistress Patricia's soft white arms, but even these arms, pretty as they were, were to be hid in the green and gold sleeves which tapered towards the tiny wrist. The little folded bodice left Mistress Patricia's soft neck bare, but kissed it here and there with a green silk ruffle, and round the slender waist was a girdle of green riband. Mistress Patricia and her mother had sent to Mr. Lowry of London for the brocade, and so well had he executed their commands, that as it lay on the white coverlet of Mistress Patricia's little bed, with the sun shining in upon it, verily it might have been a mass of emeralds set about with fine-drawn gold, so rich and gorgeous did it appear. Mistress Patricia eyed it lovingly as it lay there, creeping up at many odd times during the day to do so, and she patted it with her pretty hand, and shyly longed for the day when she should appear in it, in all her pride and dignity. But before I tell of that day, I must tell of the home in which Mistress Patricia was born. Near a city which lies not a hundred miles from London, perhaps not half a hundred, there still stands in what is now a mean suburb, the old stone house in which Mistress Patricia Tissany was born. Even now, now that its stately low-sealed rooms are let in tenements to fustian-scented artisans and their unambitious wives and children, now that its once shady lawns have been narrowed and still narrowed to allow for the building of houses and the cutting of streets, now that the surrounding space which yet belongs to it is divided into vegetable gardens for the aforesaid fustian-scented artisans and their unesthetic families, where they rear the homely potato and the flat pole cabbage so dear to the taste and pleasing to the nostrils of such as they. Now that its front gate hangs languidly by its topmost hinge, and the district round about is cheap and squalid and close, passed through with bated breath by fastidious-nosed persons, even now there is an air of old-time respectability about Mistress Patricia's birthplace. It seems to look with a calm superiority on the new brick and mortar which jostles its stained grey walls, and with pathos in its eyes on the tousled children and their commonplace parents who move about its rooms and passages. The old house is of goodly size, and its frontage has many window eyes with which to gaze on its declining situation. Ten narrow windows look out from the ground floor, five on either side of the shaky porch, with its pillars patched with yellow stains of stone age, which give support to the scarlet runners, annually holding a summer rivalry with the flat pole scorner of seasons. Above these ten windows look out another ten, sad, uncurtained eyes, and over the porch is another, perhaps the saddest of all, in that its departed glory has been greater, for it is surmounted by a stone shield, bearing a coat of arms and a date. On the roof are fifteen dormers, counting front and sides, and these should be least sad of all, being farther from the flat poles and the squalor, and nearer heaven. This is the spot as it may be looked on now, but when Mistress Patricia Tissany was born, the old house stood amid its own lawns and terraces. Peacocks strutted along its garden walls, and roses and carnations, lilies and other scented blossoms flourished along the borders, and sent fragrant messages of their well-being through the open windows. Neat serving maids tripped along its passages, and busied themselves in the stone-paved kitchen, where hams and bacon hung from the ceiling, and the bright roasting jack and the burnished pots and pans reflected the picture of comfort and plenty. While demure little Mistress Tissany ordered and arranged her household, and worshipped the husband who had installed her there. And one June day, Mistress Patricia was born in the old grey house, and in spite of her feminality was made very welcome. Perhaps the home lost a trifle of its trimness from the day of her arrival, for baby worship assumed the lead, and orderliness became a second interest. By and by many a broken toy lay about the polished floors, scratches appeared at the base of the doors where small feet had kicked for admittance, small feet which had left their print in garden soil on the flagged hall as they came. But the old house acknowledged the great importance of the small person, and even tried with faint echoes to imitate her laughter. The terrace it was, however, which she chiefly loved, the stage whereon she played the chiefest scenes of her life. It was on the terrace that her boisterous young father had paced excitedly on the day of her birth, during the forced intervals between the receiving of the answer to one message and the sending of the next. 
Here also the infant Patricia Tissini first breathed fresh outdoor air as she lay an atom of mottled humanity and an imposing show of embroidered cambric in her nurse's arms. It was here she learned to walk, clutching the short stone balustrade as she tottered in her eagerness to pick the red rose which crept between. Alas, it was here she felt the stab of the rose's thorn as she grasped it, while the peacock strutted by and gave no sympathy. It was here she kissed her plump hand, because Dorcas so bade her, to her father, as he went across the lawn for the last time, just an hour before the greedy river, idling along hard by, drew him down in her jealous embrace and bound him to her by her sinuous weeds as he leaned to pluck the water lilies from her bosom for Mistress Tissany. Here little Patricia worked her sampler, sitting by her mother's side. Here she wept over her alphabet, and from here she was led away by Dorcas for doing so. Childhood is made up of eras, to the child, and the terrace had seemed to become the proper stage on which to live chief moments. An alluring terrace it was, with its grey balustrade, lending itself for the support of roses and jessamine, syringas and barberry bushes, honeysuckle and clematis, as they rivalled one another in the perfection of their sweetness. And on this terrace, chiefest era of all to Mistress Patricia, she had met and parted from her lover. And here she hoped to welcome him back again, in her gown of green and gold, like to the peacock, unto which she had laughingly compared her. The first time Patricia remembered a visit from old lawyer Steptoe, he came alone one November afternoon, when the turf of the lawn and the trees which shadowed it were sodden with fog. Patricia, then five years old, was seated on the floor, diving for treasures in Mistress Tissany's work basket, while the widow ripped a tuck in Patricia's overall, necessary in consequence of growth. As the old man entered, Mistress Tissany rose, and looking into his face her own grew white with an undefined fear. Go to Dorcas, Patty dear, she said decidedly, and Patricia, usually so ready with a saucy protest, said nothing but went. The lawyer's visit was lengthy, and when Patricia went into the drawing room again to bid her mother good night, she saw that her eyes were red with weeping. Next morning when Patricia awoke, she saw that Dorcas also had been weeping, but she was so cheerful and gentle as she dressed the little maid that Patricia was comforted. When she looked back on that time, she could remember that not long after this, she had been kissed and wept over by everyone in the house, and then they had disappeared, all except her mother and Dorcas and William Green in the garden. Patricia inquired for them once or twice, but in time she forgot to question circumstances. She took them as she found them, and soon it seemed as if it must always have been just she and her mother and Dorcas in the house, and William Green in the garden. The second time Mistress Patricia could remember a visit from lawyer Steptoe was on her 16th birthday, when she wore her new sprigged muslin gown. She remembered it well, for new gowns were rare with her, and he came across the lawn with a tall grandson of 19 by his side, who had walked out from the city to bear him company. The name of old Steptoe's grandson was Godfrey Sylvester, and Mistress Patricia looked at him with the sun and shadow flickering over his handsome face as he neared the terrace, and he looked at Mistress Patricia, sitting there among the roses with her many coloured silks upon her lap, and thereupon they loved. After the love came, there was no measuring of time by these two young creatures. There was just a period when the mornings were as naught and unremembered, but when the afternoons were sunny and joyous, and the evenings fragrant and blissful, and these were the only hours of any value, for then they two met and strolled about the lawn, or sat on the terrace, and talked or were silent as it pleased them best, and either state was of equal eloquence. But by the calendars there passed five months from the time of their first meeting, and then Godfrey must needs start for Spain, for even in those days youths were forced to leave their loves and work. If I were but that peacock that I might ever walk beside you, he murmured as they paced the terrace on that last evening. A peacock, forsooth, conceited bird, protested Mistress Patricia with a laugh, though her girlish heart ached. Such a strut, too, as it has. I should never love a peacock. A strut is it indeed, exclaimed Godfrey, with mock wonderment in his tone and mischief in his eyes. And I had so often compared my Patricia's little air of stateliness to the grace of the peacock. Oh, Godfrey, I was never vain. No? No, sir, and if you consider that I am so, you do not know vanity when you see it. Then may I never know it, if you are not vain, he said tenderly, taking her hand. Ah, but you shall, for I will show you. 
There is no time for vanity now, my darling, he said slowly, as he looked away over the lawn. She turned to him quickly. I was forgetting, she cried. Godfrey, Godfrey, must it be two whole years? Two whole years, dear, but not one hour longer. For minutes there was silence as she sat on the stone bench beside him and hid her face in his arm. Do not, darling, he pleaded. If I were a maiden, I would weep with you, but as I am a man. She looked up at him, smiling, though her tears were heavy on her lashes. In two years' time, he began, making his voice ring cheerfully, I will come back to this spot to claim you. And I will strut as a peacock to meet you, she laughed back, and then she wept again. And when the moon was shining all white on the dewy grass, transforming the old grey terrace until it looked fair as alabaster, they said, Goodbye and on the morrow he started for Spain. So there were two years to be lived through, and the clocks and the calendars exacted every minute and brooked no bribery. But even clocks and calendars were satisfied at last, and Mistress Patricia, in her light-heartedness, had planned a gown of peacock's eyes, and the gown was ready for the meeting she had spoken of two years ago. Close on her heart lay Godfrey's last letter, telling of his homeward journey so soon to be begun. The sun shone gladly on that autumn morning. Mistress Patricia's heart throbbed wildly with its boundless joy, and all the little household thrilled with anticipation at the coming of her lover. "'He cannot be here before noon,' Mistress Patricia said to herself as she rose from her bed and pulled aside her dimity curtains at dawn, trying to force herself to believe the words. "'There must needs be so many things for him to say to his grandfather. I will not expect him until noon.' So after breakfast she took her embroidery and sat, in all the glory of her peacock gown, on the stone bench on the terrace, schooling herself to patience, chattering excitedly, whenever Mistress Tissany or Dorcas joined her for a short spell in the midst of the day's duties to dwell upon their joyfulness, and humming snatches of gay songs for very light-heartedness. But he did not come at noon, and even when the sun had dawdled across the sky and lengthened the shadows on the lawn, he had not come, and then the sunlight began to pale and the day to grow dim, and still he did not come. And after her excited chatter of the morning, Mistress Patricia grew silent, and as the day wore on, her eyes widened with pain, and the blood shuddered out of her cheeks and lips, and she paced the terrace in restless, speechless anguish. And the daylight faded utterly, and by and by the moon rose, and midnight chimed from a distant tower, before Mistress Patricia would face the truth, that the day was over, that the world was asleep, and that Godfrey had not come to her. He did not come to her. For days she paced her home in impatient anguish, waiting for the explanation. Then she fell to wondering if she were demented, if eyes and memory had tricked her as to days and hours. But if that were the case, then were her mother and Dorcas and lawyer Steptoe mad also, for they sent their questionings out into the world for an answer which never came. So she gave herself up to her sorrow and writhed in the clutch of her despair. So nearly forty years passed away, and still Mistress Patricia lived on at the old house, and many buildings grew up round about it, crowding its very garden walls and jostling one another. Squalid shops set forth their squalid wares, and grimy infants yearned outside the windows. Slatternly matrons loitered through their household duties, and soiled youth emulated them with dust and a gutter. Gentle Mistress Tissany had faded from this life to another, and lawyer Steptoe also had laid aside his pen for a celestial instrument which, to earthly imagination, seemed less fitted to his grasp. Dorcas grew silver-haired and touched with many ailments. The flowers bloomed and faded and bloomed again about the terrace. The peacock became but a memory, and the peacock gown lay hidden in the wardrobe, with lavender between its folds. But Godfrey did not come. I am fifty-eight today, thought Mistress Patricia, as she rose one June morning and looked across the lawn. I have lived sixteen years of carelessness, Six months of joy, two years of pining, and almost forty years of pain. Godfrey, Godfrey, I could easier have died for you. Life must have a strong hold on me. Then she went downstairs to Dorcas, good Dorcas, who annually had wished her many happy returns of this June day, unconscious of the stab she dealt with each word, and who still looked upon her as the young mistress. All that day, Mistress Patricia sat on the terrace in the sunshine, and all that day the words beat themselves into a monotonous refrain. I am fifty-eight today. I am an old woman. Then the twilight paled the bright colours around about her, 
and the breeze blew cool upon her face. There was another year to be lived through, and her eyes narrowed with pain at the thought of it. Then, across the lawn, as the twilight deepened to darkness, as the din of the streets sounded clear upon the air, as the weary woman sat chilled with dew and sick with longing, her lover came to her, and as she heard the footstep on the terrace, she rose and went to him, as if the world had gone back forty years, but the only words of greeting which would come to her lips were the words of that plaintive burden. I am fifty-eight today. I am an old woman. Then, as he clasped her hands, her voice changed to a passionate cry. Godfrey! Godfrey! It was terrible to bear! But he took her in his arms, all white and shaking as she was, and what did forty years matter? When Godfrey came to the old house next morning, Mistress Patricia was weeping gentle tears, and smoothing the folds of the green and gold gown which lay before her, her worn hands trembling, and the scent of lavender hanging on the air. "'It does not fit me now,' she sobbed softly. "'I shall never wear it again. My poor peacock gown!' "'Peacocks are accounted unlucky, dearest,' he told her. "'Put the gown away, and the sorrow with it. "'They had waited so long for happiness. "'It were cruel to dally with it now. "'So out into the crowded streets, "'accompanied by old Dorcas in lieu of bridesmaid, these lovers went arm in arm on their way to be married, and but few noticed them as they went, and none guessed their story. What are three old folk in the midst of such a whirl of bustle and clatter? Only Mistress Patricia's near neighbours warmed into interest when they heard of the wedding. Dear me, who'd have thought it? Poor souls! Then they returned to their own affairs, and the husband and wife picked up the broken thread of their happiness, and cast aside that tangled ball of forty years. To this day, thrilling tales of the capture of Godfrey Sylvester by brigands are told by Mistress Patricia's next of kin, and among their treasures lies the peacock gown, bright and shining as it was on the day it arrived from Mr Lowry's shop in London. Only on the soft silk ruffle is a stain as of a tear, and this is true, for I myself have seen it.